Hi boys and girls. Today we're going to start with chapter four, the museum thieves. So remember a museum is a place that you can go to look at artwork or it can be a dinosaur museum. So you can look at dinosaur bones or things from history. And usually museums are places that you look, but you don't touch. And this is called the museum thieves. Mr. and Mrs. O.J. Dart lived in the apartment above the lamb chops. Mr. Dart was an important man, the director of the famous Museum of Art downtown in the city. Stanley Lambchop had noticed in the elevator that Mr. Dart, who was an ordinarily cheerful man, had become quite gloomy, but he had no idea what was the reason. And then at breakfast one morning, he heard Mr. and Mrs. Lambchop talking about Mr. Dart. I see, said Mr. Lambchop, reading the paper over his cup, coffee cup. That still another painting has been stolen from the famous museum. It says here that Mr. O.J. Dart, the director, is at his wit's end. So now he knows that Mr. Dart is sad because somebody stole a painting from his museum. Oh dear, are the police no help? Mrs. Lambchop asked. It seems not, said Mr. Lambchop. Listen to what the chief of police told the newspaper. We suspect a gang of sneak thieves. These are the worst kind. They work by sneakery, which makes them very difficult to catch. However, my men and I will keep trying. Meanwhile, I hope that people will buy tickets for the policeman's ball and not park their cars where signs say don't. The next morning, Stanley Lambchop heard Mr. Dart talking to his wife in the elevator. These sneak thieves work at night, Mr. Dart said. It is very hard for guards to stay awake when they have been on duty all day. And the famous museum is so big that we cannot guard, whoop, that we cannot guard every picture at the same time. I fear it is hopeless, hopeless, hopeless. Suddenly, as if an electric light bulb had lit up in the air above his head, giving out this little shooting lines of excitement, Stanley Lambchop had an idea. He told it to Mr. Dart. Stanley, Mr. Dart said, if your mother will give you permission, I will put you in your plan to work this very night. Mrs. Lambchop gave her permission, but you will have to take a long nap this afternoon, she said. I won't have you up till all hours unless you do. That evening... After a long nap, Stanley went with his, with Mr. Dart. Whoop, I'm covering up some of the words. That evening, after a long nap, Stanley went with Mr. Dart to the famous museum. Mr. Dart took him into the main hall where the biggest and most important paintings were hung. He pointed to a huge painting that showed a bearded man wearing a floppy velvet hat, playing a violin for a lady who laid on a couch. There was a half a half man, half horse person standing beside them, and three fat children with wings were flying above them. That, Mr. Dart explained, was the most expensive painting in the world. There was an empty picture frame on the opposite wall. We shall hear more about that one later on. Mr. Dart took Stanley into his office and said, it is time for you to put on your disguise. I already thought of that, Stanley Lambchop said, and I brought one, my cowboy suit. It was a red bandana that I can tie over my face. Nobody will recognize me in a million years. No, Mr. Dart said, you will have to wear the disguise that I have chosen. From the closet, he took a white dress with a blue sash. So there's a picture of the painting that it looks like he wants to guard because that's his most expensive painting. And a pair of shiny, little pointed shoes, a wide straw hat with a blue band that matched the sash, and a wig with a stick. The wig was made of blonde hair, long and done in ringlets. The stick was curved at the top, and it too had a blue ribbon on it. In this shepherdless disguise, shepherdess disguise, Mr. Dart said, you will look like the painting that belongs in the main hall. We do not have cowboy pictures in the main hall. Stanley was so disgusted, he could hardly speak. I will look like a girl. That's what I will look like, he said. I wish I had never had my idea. So there is the picture of what Stanley looks like when he's dressed up in his disguise inside of the painting. So he's not very happy about it, but those are the kinds of paintings that hang in that space. But Stanley was a good sport, so he put on the disguise back in the main hall. Mr. Dart helped Stanley climb up into the empty picture frame. 
Stanley was able to stay in place because Mr. Dart had cleverly put four small spikes in the wall, one for each hand and foot. The frame was a perfect fit. Against the wall, Stanley looked just like a picture, except for one thing, Mr. Dart said. Shepherdesses are supposed to look happy. They smile at their sheep and at the sky, and you look fierce, not happy, Stanley. Stanley tried hard to get a faraway look in his eyes and even to smile a little bit. Mr. Dart stood back a few feet and he stared at him for a moment. Well, he said, it may not be art, but I know what I like. He went off to make sure that the certain other parts of Stanley's plan were taken care of and Stanley was left alone. It was very dark in the main hall. A little bit of moonlight came through the windows and Stanley could just make out the world's most expensive painting on the opposite wall. He felt as though the bearded man with the violin and the lady on the couch with the half horse person and the winged children were all waiting as he was for something to happen. Time passed and he got tireder and tireder. Anyone would be tired this late at night, especially if he had to stand in front of a picture frame balancing on little spikes. Maybe they won't come, Stanley thought. Maybe the sneak thieves won't come at all. The moon went behind a cloud and then the main hall was pitch dark. It seemed to get quieter too with the darkness. There was absolutely no sound at all. Stanley felt the air on his back of his neck prickle beneath his golden curls of the wig. Creak. I think he's getting scared. The creaking came from the right out of the middle of the main hall and even as he heard it stanley saw in the same place a tiny yellow glow of light the creaking came again and then the glow got bigger a trap door had opened in the floor of the museum and two men came up through it into the hall stanley understood everything all at once there must these must be the sneak thieves they had a secret trap door entrance into the museum from outside that was why they had never been caught and now tonight they were back to steal the most expensive painting in the world. He held very still in his picture frame and he listened to the sneak thieves. This is it, Max, said the first one. This is where we art robbers pull a sensational job whilst the civilized community just sleeps. Right, Luther, said the other man. In all the great city, there is no one to suspect us. Ha ha, thought Stanley Lapchop. That's what you think. The sneak thieves put down their lantern and took the world's most expensive painting off the wall. That would, what would we do to anyone who tried to capture us, Max? The first man asked. Well, we would kill him. What else? He, his friend replied. That was enough to frighten Stanley. And he was even more frightened when Luther came over and stared at him. This sheep girl, Luther said, I thought sheep girls were supposed to smile. Max, this one looks scared. Just in time, Stanley managed to get a faraway look in his eyes again and to smile, sort of. You're crazy, Luther, Max said. She's smiling. And what a pretty little thing she is, too. Well, that made Stanley furious. He waited until the sneak thieves had turned back to the world's most expensive painting, and he shouted in his loudest and most terrifying voice, Police! Police! Mr. Dart, the sneak thieves are here. The sneak thieves looked at each other. Max said the first one very quietly. I think I heard the sheep girl yell. I think I did too, said Max in his quivery voice. Oh boy, yelling pictures. We both need a rest. You'll get a rest all right, shouted Mr. Dart, rushing in with the chief of police and lots of guards and a policeman behind him. You'll get arrested, that's what, ha ha ha. The sneak thieves were too mixed up by Mr. Dart's joke and too frightened by the policemen to put up a fight. Before they knew it, they had been handcuffed and led away to jail. The next morning in the office of the police chief, Stanley Lampchop got a medal. The day after that, his picture was in all the newspapers. And here it has the word hero with his picture. So now we're starting chapter five and the title of the chapter is Arthur's Good Idea. For a while, Stanley Lampchop was a famous name. Everywhere that Stanley went, people stared and pointed at him. He could hear them whisper, over there, Agnes, over there. That must be Stanley Lampchop, the one who caught the sneak thieves, and things like that. But after a few weeks, the whispering and the staring stopped. People had other things to think about. Stanley did not mind. Being famous had been fun, but enough was enough. 
And then came a further change. It was not a pleasant one. People began to laugh and to make fun of him as he passed by. Hello, super skinny, they would shout, and even ruder things about the way that he looked. Stanley told his parents how he felt. It's the other kids I mostly mind, he said. They don't like me anymore because I'm different, flat. Oh, shame on them, Mrs. Lambchop said. It is wrong to dislike people for their shapes or their religions for that matter or the, for the color of their skin. I know, Stanley said. Only maybe it's impossible for everybody to like everybody. Well, perhaps, said Mrs. Lambchop, but they can try. Later that night, Arthur Lambchop was woken by the sound of crying. In the darkness, he crept across the room and knelt by Stanley's bed. Are you okay, he said. Go away, Stanley said. Don't be mad at me, Arthur said. You're still mad because I let you get tangled that day that you were my kite, I guess. Oh, skip it, will you? Stanley said. I'm not mad. Go away. Please, let's be friends. Arthur couldn't help crying a little bit, too. Oh, Stanley, he said. Please tell me what's wrong. Stanley waited for a long time before he spoke. The thing is, he said, I'm just not happy anymore. I'm tired of being flat. I want to be a regular shape again, like other people, but I'll have to go on being flat forever. It makes me sick. Oh, Stanley, Arthur said, and he dried his tears in the corner of Stanley's sheet and could think of nothing more to say. Don't talk about what I just said, Stanley told him. I don't want the folks to worry. They would only make it worse. You're brave, Arthur said. You're really brave, he said. He took, he took hold of Stanley's hand. The two brothers sat together in the darkness being friends. They were both sad still, but each one felt a little better than they had before. And then suddenly, though it was not even trying to think of it, Arthur had an idea. He jumped up and he turned on the light and he ran to the big storage box where toys and things were kept. He began to rummage into the box. Stanley sat up in this bed to watch. Arthur flung aside a football and some lead soldiers and airplane models and lots of wooden blocks. And then he said, aha, he had found what he wanted, an old bicycle pump. He held it up and Stanley he looked, and he looked at each other. Okay, Stanley said, at last, but take it easy. He put the end of a long pump and hose into his mouth and he clamped his lips tightly around it so no air could escape. I'll go slowly, Arthur said. If it hurts or anything, wiggle your hand at me. He began to pump, and at first nothing happened except Stanley's cheeks bulged a bit. Arthur watched his hand, but there was no wiggle signal, so he pumped on. And then suddenly, Stanley's top half began to swell. So swell means like blow up and get bigger. And an air pump is something you can use if your tire gets flat. So he's Arthur's idea was to pump air into his brother Stanley to see if that would make his shape change. Good idea. It's working, it's working, shouted Arthur, pumping away. Stanley spread his arms so the air could get around inside of him more easily. He got bigger and bigger. The buttons of his, his pajamas tops burst off. Pop, pop, pop. A moment more, he was all rounded out, head and body, arms and legs, but this but not his right foot. That foot stayed flat. Arthur stopped pumping. It's like trying to do the very last little bit of a long balloon, he said. Maybe shake, shake would help. Maybe a shake would help. Stanley shook his right foot twice and with a little whooshing sound, it swelled out to match his left one. There stood Stanley Lambchop as he used to be, as if he had never been flat at all. Thank you, Arthur, Stanley said. Thank you very much. The brothers were shaking hands when Mr. Lambchop strode into the room with Mrs. Lambchop right behind him. We heard you, said Mr. Lambchop, up and talking when you ought to be asleep. Ah, uh, shame on. <gasps> George, said Mrs. Lambchop, Stanley's round again. You're right, said Mr. Lambchop, noticing. Good for you, Stanley. I'm the one who did it, Arthur said. I blew him up. Everyone was terribly excited and happy, of course. Mrs. Lambchop made hot chocolate to celebrate the occasion, and several toasts were drunk to Arthur for his cleverness. So cleverness means smart ideas. When the little party was over, Mr. and Mrs. Lambchop tucked the boys back into their beds and kissed them, and then they turned out the light. Good night, they said. Good night, said Arthur, said Stanley and Arthur. It had been, had been a long and tiring day. 
and very soon all the lamb chops were asleep. The end. Now, boys and girls, this is a book um, that is a series of books. So a series means this is the first book about the character Flat Stanley, and the author has written other books. So this talks about the author. Jeff Brown created this beloved character of Flat Stanley as a bedtime story for his own two sons. He has written other outrageous books about the Lamb Chop family, including Fat Flat Stanley, Stanley and the Magic Lamp, Invisible Stanley, Stanley's Christmas Adventure, Stanley in Space, and Stanley's Flat Again. You can learn more about Jeff Brown and Flat Stanley at www.flatstanleybooks.com. Now, I knew that that story might be a fun way for me to introduce to you that you are all going to be getting something in the mail from me. So just like Stanley got mailed in a package, and got to go to California, something's gonna be coming in these envelopes to your house. And I want you to take what is inside of that envelope and do some adventures with that with um, that little surprise. So I'm gonna show you just a little sneak peek. And, And when you get that envelope, I want you to read that letter and I want you to think about the adventures that we can go on together. I hope you liked the story and I hope you have fun with all the adventures that we can do together.